you know, there's not a second that I don't look over at Nick and feel grateful. You know, we've just been through so much. He's been through so much and he's suffered so much. And, and I'm so proud of him with what he's done with, um, with his story, with his life. We always were close when I was young, but um, then going through, we like went through this horrible thing together and then just coming out the other side, we get to like work together too a lot, which is really amazing. It makes it so much more fun and, and meaningful to be able to do these speaking events that we do together and travel around the country together. And it was sort of like a, definitely a, a silver lining of such a horrible time that we got through. It's about my son. He's been doing all sorts of drugs, but he's addicted to crystal meth. I just want to know what is it doing to him? And what can I do to help him? I heard about a beautiful boy three years ago and was heartbroken by it and moved by it. And David Chef and Nick Chef's story is so powerful because this story is relevant and important right now. This is a true story about a father and a son going through this horrific adventure together. We were just going forward and thinking that this could never happen to us. And in that way, I think we're like so many families that just get blindsided when the child becomes addicted. Can you help him? We can check him in for a 28-day treatment, and then we evaluate. I thought I'd pick him up 30 days later, and he'd be fine. Relapse is a part of recovery. Relapse is part of recovery. But three or four days later, he relapsed, and that began 10 years of hell. I had never intended to write about what we were going through, but when it became clear that there was a need, I decided to go forward and do this article for the New York Times Magazine. And I thought anything that would help people not to feel ashamed of it was so important, so I was really encouraging of him writing it. There was this onslaught of attention, and that was the first time I really realized that we were not alone. Hey, okay, everybody, it's time to get together. And then my article became the book, Beautiful Boy. An editor asked if I would be interested in maybe writing a book, and I was really excited about it. I'd written maybe a quarter or a half of the book, and then I had this horrible relapse, but ultimately I finished my book. We exchanged the books. It was like a life-changing experience because I just saw how much my actions affected him and my family in a way that was really eye-opening to me. Can you say goodbye at this? Bye, when I read Tweak, I realized that as bad as I imagined it, it was worse. I cried on every page, but I also was really proud of him because he's so honest and he's really brave. No matter how much meth I can find to shoot up into my body, it's never enough. We read David Chef's Beautiful Boy and Nick Chef's Tweak, and we loved both texts deeply. There was something about these dual perspectives of father and son, which was highly unusual, and it was a window onto the disease of addiction that we hadn't seen. I understand why I do things. It doesn't make me any different, all right? I'm attracted to craziness. The story spoke to me very personally. Many years earlier, I had had my own history with drug addiction, and I had written a novel, Candy, which is a kind of uh, intense love story about two drug addicts. And so when the opportunity to talk about this film, Beautiful Boy, came to me, I had some reservations. I thought to myself, do I want to return to that subject matter of drug addiction, or have I? moved on from it. And it was the week that Philip Seymour Hoffman had died. So my father sends this email saying, Luke, sometimes I think this family is so blessed. And it was really, it just tore my heart apart because it was my dad's way of saying, I'm aware that you too could have died. So I went into that meeting with Jeremy the next morning with a really different attitude thinking, you know what? I would love to get this job because a message dropped from the heavens saying, yeah, you should do this film if you can get it. Dad, I'm really sorry about everything. Drug stories are sinister, but what is beautiful about this one is that there's a lot of goodwill, and the dream for this movie was always that it's a movie about not just addiction, but a movie about acceptance. I failed. I can't do it alone. Both books created this singular entity that I just imagined as a film could be extremely gripping. You're allowed to be mad at me, Nick. I made mistakes, I wish that I hadn't, but I did. I really was afraid to see the movie, but it wasn't just beautiful, it really captured the feeling of how we lived. Seeing the movie itself was just such a reminder of where we were and of how far we've come. What you have, you're gonna find it again. 
you're gonna get it back. I've always known Nick was an amazing writer since he was young. You know, he was published when he was in high school. And to watch him sort of uh, blossom as a writer, to just get better and better and better, you know, to write his memoirs, to write um, novel. Now he's working on writing television and movies. I mean, it's just amazing to see. And that's something we share um, and always have, you know, a love of words, a love of books. My son has gone missing. Nicholas Sheff. S-H-E-F-F. -F. There's no one by that name, sir. I think there's a responsibility that you have for the real life people. You know, I've met David Chef a couple of times, but you know, I'm not doing any sort of impersonation of him. The idea is to honor his story and to honor Nick's story. And so much of it is in the book. So much of that personal revelation is in there. So there was a lot to glean from. This got out of hand, right? Don't you think? When I heard about Steve Carell, the idea of being portrayed by him was just inconceivable. It meant the world to me, and I felt honored. And imagining this amazing actor, Timothy, playing Nick, was really exciting. When I tried it, I felt better than I ever had, so I just kept on doing it. It was a really beautiful thing to be meeting the people that you're playing and to just tell them that you hope to do justice to it. And it's really about finding the truth of the story of addiction and how addiction could take its toll on a family and loved ones. Timothy wanted to understand the physicality of being a drug addict and what the emotions were that I was feeling. So I felt very comfortable giving my story to him to tell. Dad, I'm telling you, it's gonna be good. Timothy had the ability to be this super sweet kid who had shared a special bond with his dad and who could, in a split second, turn into a crazy mad addict. What the hell is wrong with you people? No. He was super prepared to go all the way for this film. You're just embarrassed because I was like, you know, I was like this amazing thing, like your special creation or something, and you don't like who I am now. Yeah, who are you, Nick? This is me, Dad, here, this is who I am. Timmy is a lovely young man and he's, an old, old soul. And I think that's true of Nick. When I met Tim, he was talking a little bit about what it's been like for him, and it just, it reminded me of things that I felt, things I was going through when I was doing uh, Ordinary People. We were about the same age, and he's incredibly grounded and so perfect for this. You applied to six colleges, you got into all of them? Yeah. When I read with Timothy, I immediately felt a connection with him. And as he walked out of the room, everybody kind of looked at each other and nodded and said that that's the one. Yeah, we'll sort of stuff down. Steve, he has like an improv background. He loves to just kind of mess with it. That's all the stuff I love to do in a rehearsal. We were just trying new things in the scene. Are you high right now? No. Are you using? No, Dad, I'm not high right now. To watch him, the way he operates, it raises the bar and you can really feel it. I thought we were closer than most fathers we, and sons. Yeah, I feel like you're always disappointed in me. You're disappointed I didn't go to college. Can you blame me? Steve Carell as David Chef is so emotionally accessible. A person concerned with doing right, and yet he's also a very flawed person. Look at us now. This is not who we Just, are. And it felt like Steve was the perfect person to calibrate that spectrum of emotion, to paint a picture of a struggle that everyone can relate to. Timothy, he's got a good heart. And I think Nick, even at his lowest, even at his most addicted, you can still see that light that's burning within this kid that you've always loved. And that's Timothy. This was really like a dream role, to be able to wrestle with something like this at such a young age. And it's one of the most powerful places I've ever been to in my life. Do you know how much I love you? I love you more than everything. 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 That was the moment in the movie, the everything moment, that I think I lost it the most. That's a real thing that you know my dad and I used to say to each other, and it was definitely around that same incident of like me having to get on a plane and go see my mom in LA and leave my dad and all the complicated feelings that that brought up, and just being reminded of that, and and you know seeing seeing that reenacted was um, in incredibly powerful. Everything was everything. It was everything. Everything from how sad I felt and how hard it was to how much I love you. And I think that it really did contain everything and everything around that and between it. Hello? Nicholas called. He sounds desperate. Nothing we do has any effect on him. I know you feel ashamed, okay? So do I. But you have done great, David. 
And Karen, too, so thank you for that. You were up for it when I wasn't, and I'm not giving up now. Never. It's really been a great process working with this great cast. We were such a team on set. I get a definite sense of commitment from everybody to the story and to the real life people. There was this incredible moment where the chefs visited us on set and saw the family that we had recreated and there was this deep sense of love and a bond between everybody. Steve Carell, Timothy Chalamet, Maura Tierney, Amy Ryan. Those two women were extremely important to Nick and to Nick's recovery. They're both really good mothers. They just do it in different ways. So it was really important to actually cast actresses whose dimensionality came first. How do we even know he's in LA? I need to go. Yeah, but I need you to stay. Well, Vicky can't handle it. I like don't I... care about Vicky. Maura Tierney plays Karen, David's wife. Amy Ryan plays Vicky, David's ex-wife. Just love them, terrific actors. Vicky and David are a divorced couple. It's not amicable between them. Didn't you see this coming? Uh, no. No, I didn't see it coming. If I'd seen it coming, I would have done something. It's just a question, David. Jesus. What brings them together is their son's addiction. And what's beautiful about their relationship is that they are in it together for their son. What's he doing? The doctors with the nail. I'm the theater kid at heart. I grew up going to see a bunch of plays, and Amy Ryan, she's the legend of New York theater. You just don't know what it is. Please don't do this, Mom. Amy Ryan, who's an incredible actress, she just came with a couple of ideas, how she looks, who she is, and that formed Vicky's character. That is a work finish on Amy. Thank you very much, Amy. Moore's performance is extremely subtle and really beautiful. You are aware that there's a deep bond between Mora and Nick. Thank you for introducing me to your amazing son. Mora is a non-judgmental presence, but she tries to take action as well. You can't just leave. This is ridiculous. Will Come you on. Talk to us. I mean, really, but just want to talk to you. I did speak with their real Karen several times. She was sort of an unconventional mom and an unconventional stepmom. She has a lot of tolerance and patience. Look, Nick needs some more time, and that's fine. I feel hugely lucky to be part of it. Everybody on set carries that same weight of, this is a story that we gotta get right and we have to share. But also, they're proud that they're doing it. All I could think about was you. I know this must sound meaningless, but I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It has just been such an incredible experience to go through the process of, um, you know, having these books come out and now to have this movie coming out. It's just, it is such an amazing reminder and such a gift um, to be able to just see sort of portrayed on screen, like not, not just the hard times that we had, but also to see so much of the positive stuff on screen too. It's remarkable. There are moments that I look at him, this kid that I raised, who I thought I knew inside and out, and I wonder who he is. This film spans decades. It deals with the most profound questions of love, loss, childhood, parenthood. And Felix Van Groningen, he does have a feel for truths about the emotional experience of being a human being. Action! I'm fascinated by people who lose themselves. So I read the books and I totally fell in love. There were just so many cinematic things that caught my attention that it was worth spending three or four years of my life on. Uh, cut. Felix's superpower to me is he just understands human intimacy and human relationships and familial relationships. He just has an eye on these sorts of things. Uh, how help you, yeah. He yeah. really wanted to honor the story, but also make sure that it really felt really universal and that everyone would be able to relate to it. Parker. Nature was a big part of Nick and David's life growing up. They live in Marin. It's in intensely beautiful, they spent a lot of time outside, and we wanted to show, yes, this is a boy who came from a beautiful place. We wanted something that felt tactile, and warm, and organic, and safe. 
And by nature, those homes tend to be ingratiated in the landscape that surrounds them. So there's a lot of wood, there's a lot of openness, there's a lot of embracing of the natural order. This project was particularly wonderful because we did have a lot of access to the photos and to the real family, and we had this really beautiful visual history of everything that they've went through. We went up north in Marin County, where we shot the beaches and the roads and the village. We shot closer to San Francisco, Golden Gate Bridge, Haight Street, Tenderloin. It's hard to see it, thought it was right to do it there. I got what you need. To be confronted with it, to get the reality of it. Felix Van Groningen and his director of photography, Ruben Impens, talked about shooting this film in a way that was very emotional, but not using the typical tools where you're always in close-ups. The composition is extremely precise. It's not just about the frame, it's about the mood, it's about locations, it's about the story, it's about the character. This isn't like cancer, this is my choice, I put myself here. You can't overstate what a treat it is to be in front of the camera of that sort of team and all these people are here for this movie. How amazing is that? Every film is a big journey, but this one is way bigger than everything I've done before. But I got so much love back and it was so very emotional. I need to find a way to fill this black hole in me. It's easy to look at a movie like this and think, oh, this involves some pretty dark things but I see the movie as full of joy and hope and I like a real expression of humanity towards one another. I still have a family. I want them to be proud of me. I've been sober now a little over eight years, um, which is amazing to me. I stopped doing hard drugs longer ago than that, but I kept trying to, you know, just drink alcohol or just smoke pot and um, everything I tried, I did, you know, to excess. It's just that anytime I put any mind altering substance into my body, it just immediately creates this phenomena of craving. It's like being taken over by a, um, you know, a ex like a demon or something that I just can't get out of me once I let it in. So, you know, for eight years, over eight years, to have not had to put any mind-altering substance into my body is really an incredible miracle. One day, I woke up in a hospital, and someone asked me, what's your problem? And I said, I'm an alcoholic and an addict. Addiction knows no class, knows no race, knows no boundaries, and it's a modern-day crisis. And he said, no, that's how you've been treating your problem. It's about how really no one is safe from it. My mom's been amazing. My dad's been amazing, too. And so this account really brings us into that ground zero of it. It's hard to go to, but yet you leave encouraged that there's hope. This is kind of working out for me right now. I got five days sober. It doesn't look like it's working yeah. out, Nick. Oh, it doesn't look like it's working out? So what, no. then therapy, huh? You can come home. No, that we'll wouldn't... make it work, please, Nick. It hopefully will be seen by people and understood as being about and encouraging love over judgment, love over shame, and to be loving when you are being challenged. They're professionals. Let's just listen to what they have to say. Look, I'm 18, all right? You can't force me. Hey. And addiction has really sadly been cast in the shame pool of our culture. But the movie attempts to say addiction is not a moral failure. A lot of people still feel like addiction is a choice. Addiction is not a choice. I learned that lesson as a dad desperate to understand what was going on with my son. And the only way we're going to surmount that problem is when we recognize this for what it is as a disease. My son is out there somewhere. I don't know how to help him. You can't! Families really feel like they're alone going through this and they're the only ones, but there is hope out there. And ultimately, this is something that we as a country, we don't do something about it. It's just gonna get worse. So we were in agreement that it was an important story to tell and there was a real attempt to make it truthful and honest. That's what me and Timothy and everyone's hoping to portray.
I try to stand back and to say I'm watching a movie. This is not us. I mean, this is a story told by Felix and by the people who, with whom he works. Uh, but of course, underlying all that, it is our story. And it's a reminder of how lucky we are, how fortunate we are. But it's not just that we're lucky and fortunate because we survived this hell, um, but also that we have this amazing relationship and we have this amazing family.